All right, I see everybody's still filing in here. A lot of the boxes are flashing. My screen here looks like the opening cards of the Brady Bunch. But uh, I'll go ahead and start our panel discussion here today. Um, this panel is, must you like your subject? Uh, and I have great panelists here today. I'm gonna just read them in alphabetical order. Uh, we have Alan C. Gelzo, who is a, bio, a uh, Civil War historian, and for our purposes of this conversation, the biographer of Robert E. Lee. Uh, we have Mary Jordan, who has several books on several Trumps. Uh, so she's going to be a great member of this panel here. And Larry Ty, uh, a friend of mine here who's done RFK, Joe McCarthy, Satchel Page, and Superman. So he's sort of done both sides of the spectrum here. Uh, my name is Brian Jones. I'm the biographer of J uh, Jim Henson, George Lucas, Dr. Seuss, Washington Irving. Uh, but I'm going to shut up and mostly just defer to the panel here because they're going to have a lot to say. So let me start off. Our panel is, must you like your subjects? Um, I'm going to start, I think, with Mary on this one. And the question on the floor is, did you like your subjects? Somebody's got, somebody's got somebody their mic open. Can we have somebody somebody's, close the mic down? There we go. There we go. Um, Perfect. Thank you. No, I mean, I am a longtime journalist, right? And if I could only write fairly about people I liked, um, you know, that wouldn't work very well. I think more than liking your subject, um, you know, admiring them is that you, you have to have an open mind and want to be fair. And I think, you know, it's just good journalism because in the end, a biography is getting the, you know, the facts, doing the research, being fair. And so, no, I don't think you have to like your subject. Um, I'm very mindful though, uh, long time ago, talk to David Halberstam about this, same question. And he said that the only book that really wasn't successful, didn't work, was one that he did in Japan. Um, it was the time when the Japanese auto market, you know, was the tops in the world. And he didn't like the subject. He said, because he didn't like the subject, it didn't really work because he didn't put his soul and heart and everything into it. So there's kind of two different things. Like if you don't like your subject, you don't really want to spend the time with it. You can have a bad book, but should should you admire the subject you write about? I say no. So. Is there a is there a healthy balance between liking and not liking your subject? Let me, let me start with you, Alan, because you had a subject who who whose reputation at least has evolved shortly and uh, your relationship with that character can change going into it. Um, is, is there an ideal relationship you, that you thought maybe you should have with your subject? If there is, I haven't discovered it yet. <laughs> uh, and that's not just on the subject of Robert E. Lee or any of the other biographies I've undertaken, which in this case really amounts only to Abraham Lincoln. And <laughs> that's covering quite a gulf quite right there between Lee and Lincoln. But if I'd rather write about a likable or an unlikable subject, I mean, there's pitfalls in both. Uh, certainly, it would seem that you would be in a better position writing about a likable subject. The problem is that likable can be a sly word for convenient because it's easier. Uh, you don't have to hold your nose. You don't have to worry all the time about what readers will think of you uh, for having written about an unlikable person. The problem is that it tempts you to tell people your subject stinks. <laughs> and people love to hear that because it makes them feel good about their own inadequacies. So <laughs> to me, to me the, the question is, um, is, is not a matter of likable or unlikable. My question is, what is the role this particular person played? How vital and important was it in the scheme of the subject at hand? And what is there about this person either personally or otherwise, which will help us to understand why that person exercised that role or that influence. For me, it's not really profoundly a question of like or unlike. And it's interesting because we, we tend to think about, or at least I do, I know when I'm writing, I tend to think of these people oftentimes as characters uh, in a story. Larry, you're, you've got some interesting ones because you've done sort of both sides of the spectrum here, but, you know, everybody would say that a good story needs a villain. And there's a reason that, you know, Satan is the, the most interesting character in Paradise Lost. How do you approach somebody like um, Joe McCarthy? I mean, you've almost got a relish telling the story of somebody who is obviously the villain of the piece. Yes. 
So I want to back up for a second and say, in a way, like Mary, as an old journalist, you can't rid yourself of journalistic habits, which is trying to be fair. And I find it more difficult in a way to write about somebody that I adore, like Bobby Kennedy, because you know that there are clay feet somewhere there, and there's another side to his story. And the I only felt comfortable starting to write that book when I realized all the bad things, along with all the great things that he had done. And it was Ethel Kennedy who pointed me to Joe McCarthy. And she said something that I could never get out of my head, which is, Joe McCarthy might have been an evil character for most of the world, but for Bobby and me, he was just plain good fun. And good fun, there are a lot of words, that, adjectives that I think of when I think of Joe McCarthy. Good fun weren't among them. And what I realized in researching McCarthy was that there were things the guy did that were actually upstanding and not quite noble, but there was a decent side of McCarthy, a small decent side, which is what made half of America fall in love with him. And it was only when I started seeing that, in fact, he had told the truth, for instance, about being a war hero. And much of the world knew Joe McCarthy as Tail Gunner Joe, which was making fun of him and th suggesting that he was not the war hero during World War II that he had said he was. And when his papers were released, it turned out that he was. And so the lesson to me was even the worst liar in the world sometimes tell the, tells the truth. And, and getting to that truth is a piece of getting the full story of who he is. So is there is there something, are, are you shocked when a character who you thought was irredeemable then ends up having a redeemable quality? I'll start with you, Larry, and then I'll actually move to Mary, who I think uh, probably had some of the most uh, I don't want to say fun, but maybe fun discovery as she was going on as well. So, Brian, I love the way you phrase that. Joe McCarthy was never redeemable, but he had redeemable qualities about him. And that, again, said to me, I'm now beginning to understand why Ethel Kennedy and Bobby Kennedy, two, a hero and a heroine of mine, adored Joe McCarthy. And if we can't find redeemable characters about villains who we're writing about, my guess is we're probably not looking hard enough, but Mary would know better than me. Mary, we'll throw to you there. You're muted. There you go. So when I took on um, a deadline project to write about Melania Trump, um, there were enormous amount of rumors because she had been a model and she had taken all her clothes off. She had first first lady to have posed nude. Um, and I think probably everybody on the call knew about the rumors about her background. So I went to Milan, I went to Paris, I went and talked to all the photographers, everybody who knew her in all these different cities, starting with her hometown. And when I like got through archives in Italy, and um, I, I think by the way, because I had been a foreign correspondent and had worked in different languages, it was a real big help. And one of the reasons that so little was known about Melania, because she only arrived in America at 26 and where she had been, you, you needed other languages, whether it was Italian or Slovenian or French. Anyway, when I found out this scene that I, I would say a lot of people didn't want to hear was that she had won this competition when she was 19 at this like Hollywood studio in Italy, where Sophia Loren had gotten her start. And when she won it, she was, the, the prize was to be in a movie. Um, but then one of the producers basically said, well, but you can't get the prize unless you sleep with me. And she and her mom left. And so she never um, got to be in that movie. But here was something was going against the grain of everything you'd been hearing about this woman. Now she was 19, but it was really an interesting thing that hadn't been reported before. But you know, it was also interesting to hear all the people who were like, that can't be true. You know, the, the people in there, especially very famous people, they have in their head um, what they think happened. And I'm the only one that saw the record, talked to the people and went to Rome. 
Um, and so I thought that was kind of interesting because it was like Larry was saying, things that go against the grain that you find out. And that, that was just research. Um, now, likewise, uh, an earlier book I had done about this woman who was a nun in Mexico who took care of prisoners called The Prison Angel, it added enormously to the dimensions of that woman when I found out how, as you know, we called her very Randy. This is this woman who had been twice married, loved guys, talked about sex and was a nun. And that just made for not what you think about a nun as you know, so we had Randy Nunn, the prison angel who did all this interesting stuff. And I guess in both cases, people are more complicated. I have never yet found anybody that's one of anything. They're not, you know, I mean, Melania certainly is a complicated character, but it's absolutely true that when she was 19, that she and her mom, you know, turned on their heels rather than sleep with this guy just to get the prize. So that's something you found out in the writing. Alan, one of, so your, your character though, it's not so much, so a lot, a lot of what is, was out there on Lee was, was already there. It wasn't necessarily discoverable. It's not so much with your subject that the subject has changed. It's the times that have changed. How, do, how, does, how does that, does that get in your head when you're writing about a character whose the public perception of this character has changed significantly over, you know, even five, 10 years? Well, I, I'm, I can't let that. I can't let the fear of a perception interfere with how I am trying to understand and interpret uh, this person, because that means that with every shifting wind of opinion, uh, then the fundamental reason for what you're doing changes. I'm, I tend to be very dicey about the idea that the goal of a biography should be some kind of redemption. Um, I find most such redemptions to be full of all kinds of special pleading. Uh, I don't think the biography for that same reason should sneer or whimper, but I think biography also has to be very self-aware because biography in a lot of ways is the production of an illusion. The biographies that, that we write are based on scattered pieces of evidence. And the more so if you really don't have uh, the live person there to interview, or if you're not dealing with people who knew that person, I'm dealing with someone who died more than 150 years ago. So there's no one left to tell me I knew him when. What we're more often in the position of being is archeologists. Uh, we're trying to put together the, you know, the shards of some long lost amphora and trying to make them look like the real thing. Problem is there's no guarantees that we're getting the relationships right. Sometimes the most important things in someone's life are exactly what you can get your hands on. Love, grief, these, these are not elements that, that people express easily. And yet they're the high moments of biographers. And so biographers are tempted to gin them up in ways that the subject might not ever have recognized. Uh, I, it seems to me that one of the great problems of biography, not just about writing about someone like Robert E. Lee, but in any biography, is, is how much biography is tempted to conceal what it doesn't have evidence for. Uh, biographies are inexact. They're incomplete. And yet, we want them to speak about their subject with some kind of seamless and unbroken voice. So there's a certain skepticism, a certain reluctance in my part to assume that I am able to utter the last word on this particular subject. And I fully expect that 50 years on from now, someone else will be writing a biography of Robert E. Lee or someone like him and come to some very different conclusions. What I am constantly impressed upon is the incompleteness yeah. of what we try to present and what we try to work with. And I'm always trying to keep that in view when I'm making judgments about this particular person. But, but it's, but it's, it's, I mean, as, as time progresses and, and views change and we find more information and things evolve, it, it, every biographer is viewing their subject through the prism of the window they're looking through at the moment, whether it scatters the light or focuses it is, is a tough call. I mean, so you as, you know, as a researcher, you know what you know, and there's times when you don't know what you don't know. <laughs> I mean, does that make it, you know, again, where you're sitting now, does that make it harder? And I'm not saying that you wanted to redeem Lee, but I mean, you got, 
the the public perception of leave was probably different when the book came out than it was when you started it. Um, you know, how, again, it's, it's not even so much as a researcher, but as a storyteller. Um, is there something that, you know, you know how Lee's perceived now? Are you trying to almost, I don't want to say over-explain, but I'll say over-explain Lee to people in the modern time? Well, I think in the case of Robert E. Lee, much of the biographical, biography writing about Lee, which curiously enough, began even before the man died, there were biographies of them being written. A lot of them was real, hardcore hagiography. And that persisted straight up until the 1930s when, when Douglas Suckall Freeman produced this four-volume biography of Lee. There was a tremendous amount of scholarly material that went into that. And the sheer, uh, Im the impression made by that was almost so that it scared people away from writing about Robert E. Lee for a long time. The big break about Robert E. Lee didn't occur in just the last few years. The big break really occurred in 1977 when Thomas Connolly published a study of Lee, not really a biography, but it was a study of Lee called The Marble Man, which began to call a number of things into question. That, you might say, was the first crack in the teacup. That was followed then by biographies that widened that crack. Uh, what I was doing was not exactly carving out an entirely new niche about Lee, as I was building on questions that had been raised over the last 25 to 30 years, and maybe even a little more, about Robert E. Lee. Uh, the one thing I've, I've always tried to bear in mind, though, is that when we come to writing biography, a lot of the time, we have to look for concealment in our subjects, whether it's a subject we admire or not. I find myself in, at many moments looking for the dog that didn't bark in the night, and yet, I think at the same time, a biographer has to have a certain willingness to be surprised by virtue. And I think that that entails on the biographer a demand to be wise, to be sane, and not to make easy leaps. And yet, having said that, I know that biogra biography, almost more than any other nonfiction genre, um, is prey to making those kinds of leaps largely because we don't always know what we don't know. Right. Which is usually the hardest, the hardest part of it is, yeah, that, that's the stuff that makes you stay up at night. You yeah. used the word uh, hagiography. I'm going to go to Larry on this one. Larry, you and I have both written about sort of, you know, American do-gooders in a way. I've done Jim Henson. You've done, you've done RFK uh, numbers. Is it almost, when you're dealing with a character like that, is it almost, and, and, and Alan touched on this a little bit, and Mary talked about it almost going the other way. Is, is it a relief when you find something um, negative about these, about these characters you're writing about? For, you know, I found out Jim Henson was never faithful to his wife, and I was almost relieved I finally had something like that. Um, what did you find, or did you have that sort of similar relief? You mentioned a little bit when you do find, you know, the, the feet of clay, as it were, in your, in your character you're writing about. Your subject. I keep calling them characters. Your subject. So there is there, there is relief for the reason that Mary talked about that that we're trying to be fair and if everything is hagiography hey, um, a it suggests you didn't look very deeply and b nobody's going to believe you and when I found out that Bobby Kennedy had been weaned um, at the feet of Joe McCarthy and had started out my liberal icon had started out life as a cold warrior colder than his dad and justifying Joe McCarthy, it said to me, this guy's got a more interesting and layered story. And it actually made him even more of a hero in many ways in my mind that he had traversed from a right wing cold warrior to a liberal icon suggested in my mind that he had grown. And I wanted to understand that growth and how much he was steering where American politics was, were, was going and how much he was reflecting it. But if I can return for a second to what Alan was talking about, you can tell that he's a, a noble historian and that I'm a hack journalist um, because I would have offered a bit of a different answer. I think every publisher cares about the story that we're writing, no matter how old or how long dead the person we're writing about, cares about it the way you were suggesting, Brian, in the modern context. And I want to say with Joe McCarthy, a couple of days before the 2016 election, I had signed up to write a biography of Barack Obama. 
And the day after the election, I realized we wouldn't know Obama's legacy until the end of the era of Trump, but that to understand Donald Trump, I made a case to the publisher, we've got to understand the guy who he looked to for his playbook, who was Joe McCarthy. Joe McCarthy via a lawyer who worked for McCarthy named Roy Cohn, who was Trump's protege and, I'm sorry, Trump's mentor and McCarthy's protege. And it was, especially when the book came out a few months before the election, what my publisher wanted to hear about was both the story of Joe McCarthy and the story of Joe McCarthy as it related to the story of Donald Trump. So I wish I could be as noble as Alan and say, this is a character from history and what's going on today doesn't matter. If I said that, my publisher would stop publishing my books and we all have to look at what the context is and why average Americans, other than people who already buy into these stories, why they should care at that moment. So you, you talked about you know the, the the first of all your different the, 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 your 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 different answers versus Alan's answer, and you talked about the public perception of this. Is there what is the difference between must you like your subject and must the public like your subject, or must your reader like your subject? I'll start with you, and then I'm going to go down the line here on this because I want to hear everybody's answer on this. Yeah. So. I think that's a really interesting question, and I hope nobody from my publishing house is listening right now. But I think that the, I think it is a tougher sell to have people buy your book, especially if they're not somebody who's in the news every second like the Trumps were, if it's an unlikable character. Reading a book on Adolf Hitler or Joe McCarthy, um, especially in an era of Trump when a lot of people were sick of the Trump story and thought McCarthy might be a redux of that. It's a tougher sell to sell it, whereas Bobby Kennedy or Satchel Paige or Superman are heroes now and forever. And I think that that I respect publishers who are game to take on evil characters that might be tougher to sell biographies of. Uh, that, I think it's a perfect way to move to Mary on that because you've got probably... Um, I think in a way you don't want the public almost to like your subjects. I mean, you know, there's a reason that the Joker gets his own movie <laughs> at the same time Batman does. I mean, so what, what's your view on that? Well, we, we wrote a book um, about the impeachment trials, the backstory of Trump's impeachment. And, you know, that was kind of for history. You know, we, we felt that that was something that um, was worthy of doing, but I, I mean, the answer is what Larry said is people, you know, if you if you want to sell books, it's pretty hard, I think, to write about uh, somebody that people a they're not interested or they don't know or they don't like. Um, you know, the, now, having said that, you still do things like the impeachment trial because we knew we just felt like that was kind of an obligation. We were sitting there at the right moment. We had all kinds of help on it. And, and this was kind of something that I think teachers and classrooms can use about what happened there, especially in an era when there was a lot of disinformation and, you know, what, what official channels were saying was not what was going on. So sometimes you tackle it, not because you think people like the subject or will buy it. Uh, but, you know, it's also nice to have a lot of people buy your books. And, um, this one, it's interesting about the prison angel that we wrote 17 years ago. We were we just recorded the audiobook because there was demand for it, and there's a movie coming out about it. Because 17 years ago they didn't do audiobooks. And I'll I'm kind of interested in the books that do well on audio because greater and greater numbers mm -hmm. are listening to them. Um, and that is, it's just like there are stories that I write for the Washington Post that do better on your, you know, most people now are actually reading them on your phone and you have to change the headlines and the photos for a phone format than you would for a, t a screen. And the same thing is with books now. And so uh, again, when you're writing about people that are so vivid that you can see the description when on audio, like when you're writing about it, you know, now I think more because I just came from 16 hours of recording that book and, it, and, and, it, and it did work. 
um, because it was in a prison in Mexico. It was so, you know, just as Mexico, everything is, there's no such thing as a White House in Mexico, right? It's reds and orange and, you know, the drug cartel. And it really works on audio. So I'll be curious about going forward as more and more people listen to books, how that changes how people pick subjects too. For sure. Alan, what's your view on whether, you know, not just whether you like your subject, but whether your reader should, and you might actually have seen a regional spike in sales, I'm guessing with your book. Well, I don't know if there has been any kind of regional differential in terms of the readership of uh, Robert E. Lee Life. I did not set out to write it that way. In fact, I'm almost across purposes that in that respect because I'm I'm a Yankee from Yankee Land. <laughs> I'm a Pennsylvanian and grew up in Pennsylvania. I never really entirely understood the kind of cult-like fervor that is entertained for Robert E. Lee in some quarters. There's a, an interesting painting in a New Orleans gallery. It's not to be taken seriously, but it's an interesting painting all the same that portrays the Southern version of the Trinity. And it's Jesus, Elvis, and Robert E. Lee. And to me, that was just for starters, foreign. So what I have written about Lee really has begun by asking what I think is probably the most interesting question to me about Robert E. Lee. And that is, how do you write the biography of someone who commits treason? And I don't use the word lightly. I'm not just throwing it out there as a term to inflame opinion. I'm looking at it legally, constitutionally, historically. Uh, Lee committed treason. How do you write the biography of someone who does something like that? So that puts the thing in a different category for me from a question of will the reader like the subject? Must the reader like the subject? Must I like the subject? In, in my understanding, the reader can make what the reader will of what I have written. I would prefer that the reader understand the subject rather than like the subject. Understand what treason is, understand in what respect we must say that Robert E. Lee commits treason, understand why he was never put on trial for it, understand why the last five years of his life go on without any molestation that way. Now, I recognize that may not be why people read biographies, um, in many cases, I suspect people read biographies because what they're looking for is either some kind of noble building up on the, on the pattern of King Arthur, uh, mm -hmm. or else what, they're, what they want is something a little bit more voyeuristic. They want to look through a little peep through the bedroom keyhole. Uh, but that's not really what I'm interested in doing. I'm interested in understanding as much as possible over the span of a very long time on the basis of fragmentary evidence what this person did, why they did it, and why it's important. And that may not go a whole long distance toward uh, redeeming someone who is considered to be contemptible or glorifying someone who isn't. Uh, but on the other hand, I don't think it's a good idea for a biographer to fall prey to a kind of Stockholm syndrome mm -hmm. in which the, um, the biographer falls into the hands of the person they're writing about and either assumes the role of advocate or the, the role of condemner in chief. I mean, there are occasions when you have to make judgments and there are occasions when you're writing a biography of a genuinely admirable character. I mean, think of a biography of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, for instance, but not every subject is a saint. The opportunities for entrapment are real. And I think always when you're writing a biography, you have to keep that balance in mind. You have to keep your subject just a little bit at arm's length. Otherwise, the empathy that a biographer needs just to write about another person can eventually decay into a kind of cheap sympathy. And to me, that ruins the whole biographical project. Yeah, I like Stockholm Syndrome as well put on yeah, that. Well, <laughs> that's what it sometimes seems <laughs> right. like when I'm looking at the way some biographies have been written. Uh, it does seem like yeah, yeah, these are people who spent too much time in the company of this this individual. 
Well, but I mean, I think I think that's a the the risk we all run with our subjects. Um, I, I think I was telling in an offline email to you guys, I have a hard time compartmentalizing. I I I would have a harder time writing about a Joe McCarthy, I think, for example, or a Trump, because I living with your character, again, I'm calling them characters, but living with your characters, you do two years, three years, five years, however long it takes to write that. I'm not sure I I could compartmentalize myself that enough. And you know, Jack Farrell, who's written about Nixon and Will Smith, who's done Nixon and done their marriage. Um, I mean, how does it, how, how do you separate work from work from play uh, when you're writing something like this? I'll go to you and then I'll actually go to Mary and I want Larry to answer this too, writing about McCarthy. How do you, how do you separate yourself? I mean, I think that's a very real concern. I, I have a hard time doing it. I think it's a very real concern some biographers have. Go ahead, Alan. Well, I was going to say that if that were the case, then every time we bump into a difficult biographical subject, mm -hmm. we almost have to say, oh, well, we can't write about this person. Right. Well, there are people who are often great mixtures of things like that. Winston Churchill, for instance. Winston Churchill strikes out in terms of his attitudes on colonialism, the, the great debacle of the Dardanelles, that, that inexplicable defense of, of, of Edward uh, and, uh, and, and the whole question of who was going to succeed to the throne in the, in the 1930s. If, if that was all that Churchill's career was, was made of, you would have great difficulties that way. There's not, there's not a lot to find in him that would be admirable. But then you come to the Churchill of 1940 to 1945, and suddenly all that, has, all that moves in a very different direction. So there has, to be a, there has to be a degree of compartmentalization or else what you wind up writing about is not that person, but yourself. Right. And at the same time, the biographer does have to stand in judgment against a single person. And that judgment is almost face to face, like a prisoner in the dock or, or the judge at the bench. So there is, an, a, there is a degree of compartmentalization or else what you're simply writing is an op-ed. Mary, so you, I mean, you're, you're, a, you're a great journalist and you have that ability to view your subject um, impartially, I guess, but you're also not viewing your subject under a microscope. There's that human component you bring to it as well. Um, you know, again, how do you compartmentalize when you're working on a subject that you're like, I wouldn't have dinner with this person, but, uh, but you're bringing your own empathy to the story to telling, even if it's a, even you're, even if it's, you don't want somebody to sympathize with them. Well, uh, I what, would have dinner with them. I mean, I uh -huh. just, I'm fascinated by fascinating people. So yeah. I don't, you know, I mean, I, I, I mean, I just think it's the old school training of journalism, right? Is that it's just, wow, this is so interesting. Um, but I wanted to just slightly change that question. I, I think there's a huge difference in writing about someone who's living. And who's I was going to ask that. Because, um, and I think that someone should really seriously think about writing about someone who's still alive. <laughs> um, uh, because first of all, I mean, obviously people change and that, you know, people do crazy things or redemptive things at the end that completely changes the picture. And that was always very frightening to me because I was, well, in the Melania case, um, again, it was on deadline. The publisher really wanted that out before the 2020 election because she either was going to be not first lady anymore and nobody would care. You know, th so there was this horrible time pressure and I felt like I needed more time um, because I could see that she was changing in the White House, right? And when January 6th happened, the book was supposed to be done and I, you know, had a throw of whatever you call it, a fit and just say, you can't, we have to include this in the book because this is the most significant thing. She, if she doesn't speak there, that is, that says a lot. I mean, it was just such a weighty thing. But again, when you're de dealing on deadline with someone in re who's alive and still doing things, you can cut it off. You know, it's kind of like seeing a movie and not seeing the end. Um, and so that was, that was the real hardest part. And I've talked to other people about this and they're like, well, that's why I'm never doing somebody alive too, because also it's hard to get permissions and right. documents and letters. And, you know, there's, there are people that the person who's alive, you know, six on you and, you know, and they, 
they clutter up your email box and they try to confuse you. And I mean, it, it is really hard when someone is alive. Now, it's a whole other story if they've been dead for 150 years like Robert E. Lee. But I don't know. I, I think the ideal thing is that you kind of have enough of a certain person's life or you decide you only want to write about a section of a life. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great point. I was I was going to ask that and I'll ask it of Larry too because I've written very dead, mostly dead, and alive, and uh, and I think the mostly dead is the hardest part because you still have the family trying to ensure legacies or things like that. Where and when they're when the subject's alive, the goalposts do keep moving, but I actually think that middle tier is harder. Uh, because you have other people trying to define that life for you. Um, Larry, did you find that? I mean, you're dealing with RFK and with heirs and with, you know, family members still with who are very alive, trying to shape and mold that legacy. Is is that a harder road to hoe than writing about somebody very dead? So I'm in a way in between what Alan and Mary do. Alan writes about people who are long dead, as are their contemporaries. Mary writes about people who are alive and their to be interviewed or um, to try to interview. And I'm writing about people, the one consistency in the nine books that I'm the... Uh -oh. Does everybody else see Larry frozen there or is it just me? In terms of real people to talk to. And with Bobby Kennedy, um, there were, I think I did 400, 450 interviews, and that was not just an important piece of writing about him, but it was part of the fun of doing it. I can't, again, not being a historian, just dealing with papers would be an untenable process for me. But I want to go back to your earlier question about um, we are human beings, and the idea of spending three years with Joe McCarthy wasn't exactly the person I wanted to, especially um, during a pandemic, to have in my study and in my life for that long. And the book that I'm writing now was my publisher's reward to me and my reward to myself for spending three years with Joe McCarthy. And I'm now spending three years with three guys named Ellington, Armstrong, and Basie. And it is a blast. And if you know as little about music and especially about jazz as I do, it's also a total exploration. And it just, um, I think that we should go back and forth in terms of doing people that are villains and doing people the heroes. But Brian, I'd like to turn a question to you and ask what it was like you started out with as a, a Sesame Street kid. I can't imagine anybody who was higher in our pantheon of heroes and of childhood heroes than Jim Henson. When you took him on, did you envision that you were going to come up with things? Did you already know some of the dark sides that you uncovered with him? And was it fun or difficult or how did you deal with this guy going from being a hero to less of one? Um, I, I had not heard, I'd only heard rumor on Jim. Um, actually the first person to tell me about Jim's infidelity was his wife. <laughs> so, uh, and once, and once that got cracked, um, everybody had a story. Every, it was, it was the worst kept secret actually around, but nobody had really asked the question explicitly before. So as, as I said, at one point, it was almost a relief when I had that, because then I thought, well, great. Now, nobody, you know, now, now nobody can say, well, you're carving this, this marble figure, um, because you've actually got something that you know you could say here's something that made him imperfect which you you know you're always trying to sort of strike that balance um i'd always heard the rumor that he was on drugs i found out he'd really only done drugs once i mean he was a you know a pot guy but he'd done lsd and it didn't do anything to him which i thought was very telling that people take lsd to go to other worlds and jim henson was kind of already there <laughs> and didn't didn't need that help so so it was one of those things that it was it's you know it gets to alan's question about knowing what you don't know i didn't even know i didn't know this until the widow brought it up and then at that point, it was off to the races and I could ask the story and every and, and it, it had almost like cleaned out the spit valve in a way, because when I asked the question, I would always be I could always then say, Jane, Jane actually is the one who brought this up. I mean, it almost like, you know, cleared the way people said, oh, well, if the, you know, if the widow and the family are talking about it, you're good. Um, so, I, you know, I think that I think that was very helpful uh, in, a, in a writing about that particular side of him. And there's just somebody else had brought it up. And, and that clears the way to when I would talk with Joan Gans Cooney about Sesame Street. She wanted me to turn off the microphone and said, are you going to write about the women? And as soon as I said, Jane brought it up, she's like, well, turn the mic back on. 
Um, so it kind of clears, kind of clears the path for you. So you're the brilliant moderator. Can I just though, throw one quick question to Mary? Sure. She talked about writing about people who are alive. And I think that is exciting that they're there and that you, their story is evolving and you can talk to them. But I've always wondered, as somebody who writes about dead people like Alan does, I've often wondered, how do you know that they're going to sustain themselves in terms of being a character that truly stands the test of historic interest when they're alive and their story is evolving? How do you know that we're going to care about Melania Trump, you know, when Donald Trump is no longer on the horizon? Is that a worry for you? And how do you deal with that? Well, a lot of people told me they don't care now when I wrote about that book. <laughs> okay. So, so um, I think when you have somebody, you know, there's only a few dozen people that have become president. So I think whether you like them or not, the bigger worry for me is when you only have part of the story if, if they're alive. But there are certain people that just by virtue of their moment in history, uh, I think they it's worthy of, right? Even if they're dead or alive. But, but one thing that Larry, that you said that is so important is that, um, you know, in case we only live to be a hundred, you do only have as a writer, as a person, you only have so much time. And when you do one of these books, you sleep it, you eat it, you like they're in your head. It's who you talk to. It's who you're trying to talk to. And if you don't pick carefully, you can, um, you know, when I was doing the Melania book, it was sometimes I felt like I had to stay in the shower longer. I mean, it was like the people that I had to deal with, it was like even in the modeling world, I mean, you can't even imagine what these people were like, you, you know, and it just, it, it didn't feel good. And, um, and so you do need to then write a book about fine wine in the Bordeaux or something, <laughs> because um, when I was, in the most extreme case of this, um, I'm from Cleveland, Ohio, and there was, there were these three girls that were held and kidnapped and kept in a house for 10 years, Amanda Berry, Gina de Jesus and um, and uh, Michelle Knight and they it was such a sad horrible story and not all that far from where I had grown up so um, I helped my husband and I helped them write their book for two years so that they could have money uh, it was their story the money went to them we just kind of I mean they they were they didn't know how to write a book. I mean, but they had a story and they had nothing. I mean, they had no money. And so the book would got them a house so that they could keep going. During that book, they were only talking to us and it was so sad and so depressing. And I had didn't realize the effect it was having on me, but one day the phone rang and um, it was this Harvard psychiatrist who was doing a research paper on secondhand trauma. And she said, you know, you're writing this book, you have secondhand trauma. I said, no, no, I don't. And then my daughter, I was talking to my daughter, she was, what are you talking about? You know, you're like a different person because you just it, take it in. And so, and then it's it, two different, this three different psychiatrists called to talk about sec secondhand trauma, which I think is interesting. In this case, these girls were alive, this really happened. They were, you know, I mean, everything had to go through me and it was mostly like me talking to them and then my husband and I were trying to help them write it. But it was, that was, you know, th that was one of those things where you don't want to do something like that again for a little while. <laughs> Alan, I mean, you're mostly a Civil War historian, but I mean, are you moving on to another project now that sort of, you know, clears your palate as well? Not yeah. that you necessarily need that, but. Yeah, in fact, I've got uh, more than one iron in the fire that way. I'm already starting to write the next opus. Uh, I've tried to find a 12-step process for this somewhere, but I haven't <laughs> succeeded yet. Um, one of the things about biography that I think is, um, is particularly peculiar this way, and maybe in some respects it's because I'm mistrustful of uh, my own tendencies toward empathy. I mean, Mary was talking about secondhand trauma. The empath 
is a person who is often very prey to that. And that's something I think that has to be guarded against because not only does it warp what we write, but it can actually do some real damage to ourselves. I think there's a, there's a dark side to biography that we need always to be self-aware about because a biographer is frequently in, in something of the position um, of a burglar who is, who's breaking and entering into people's lives and tearing things apart in, in search of some good stuff uh, that they can make off with. But of course, we make this look very official because we also hand around business cards for what we do. Um, I, I think at the worst, biographers can sometimes be a species of stalker and, and they invite their readers to join them in, in the, all the guilty pleasures of that. Um, biography, I think, has this great danger. It can dehumanize. It can violate. It, it reaches out, it appropriates, and then claims that it's done something, something noble and, and useful uh, for all the rest of us. Uh, I think that biography, if it is really going to be an art, should be a play for life a play against death, against dissolution. And if we can keep something of those things in view as we are writing biography, then I think we're, we're not only doing something which is important and valuable for, for our readers, but I think we're also doing ourselves a favor. Now, Larry, that sounded like a, a page out of your playbook. How would you respond to that? So I think those are um, really important warnings. I, I'm not sure how you keep, I think Alan's a lot more empathetic than um, he suggests and probably um, less removed from his topics, but I think it's interesting. Um, I want to quote, partly... I want to quote you to my students about that, <laughs> I, okay, especially, okay. especially since we've just done final exams. I love it. The, um, so I also think that it is what we run up against when we're writing about people who are controversial people, and by definition, everybody that the three of us or the four of us are writing about are controversial, we run up against people who despise them and people who mythologize them. And with Bobby Kennedy, um, the longer the circumstances of his life and of his death, and the idea that I think many Democrats are still looking for a Bobby Kennedy lookalike who has some combination of um, liberalism, but a toughness to get things done. And I think what we run up against, interestingly, is um, what we do with those mythologizers. And the Kennedy family is famous for um, trying to mythologize or sweep over the kinds of things that we as biographers are trying to uncover. And what I found incredibly refreshing of the people that I interviewed, I, I mentioned that for that book, I interviewed 400, 450 people. Um, I would say 350 of them were people who were trying to tell me that anything bad that I was finding about Bobby Kennedy, it was had more to do with me than him. Um, the one person who gave me credence to go ahead with it. And she was my savior. And this, the only one of those 450 who was irreplaceable was Ethel. And whether it was Bobby's affairs or Bobby's Joe McCarthy roots, she let me see, despite what her children told me or despite what all the, the Kennedy fans out there said, um, she let me see that he did have clay feet, but in the end, that made him more human and more credible. And I think what we're looking for in each of our cases, um, and we might find it with one person or a number of people, are the people who knew the character we're writing about well enough to tell us that it is okay to say something nice about Joe McCarthy or okay to say something bad about Bobby Kennedy. And I'm finding in writing about Ellington, Armstrong, and Basie, the longer they're dead, the more they've become sainted. And they had lots of things going on in their lives that would disqualify them for most. Um, uh, Alan is the expert on sainthood here, I think, but the, the, um, the, that would disqualify them for sainthood. And I think we want to get with each of us and with all the people who are tuned in here to those people who we think have enough credibility that we can run by the bad and the good stuff that we find and give us the real touchstones. Is this legitimate? 
Yeah, it is interesting that, you know, yours was Ethel. And again, with, with my subject, it was the wife who was the one who was very forthcoming with the negative on it. Mary, I mean, how do you, how do can you, I go, ahead. Ask, go ahead. Sorry, can I just ask both of you, why do you think, Larry, why do you think it was Ethel? Because often when you have that critical person, you're always looking for their, their try to make sure you know their motive too. Why do you think Ethel did that? And Brian, why do you think Jim's widow did, allowed that? So I figured that um, what I realized when I talked to Ethel about the other woman in Bobby's life. So Bobby Kennedy um, was not as much of a, I'm not sure what the proper word to use these days is, but not as much of a philanderer as his brothers, but that left a lot of room. And he did things in his personal life that um, were not faithful to Ethel and to the 200 kids that they had together and were left at home. And what I realized in talking to Ethel was that she was not like many of Bobby's defenders denying that those women existed. What she was telling me was at the end of the day or at the end of the night, he came home to me and he was a great husband and a good father, a terrific father. And that just, rather than looking at the yes or no question, I wanted to understand how you piece together these different sides of him, this guy who was iconic and a morally upstanding guy in so many realms, and yet in this realm of his personal life could do these things. And the idea that Ethel forgave him said to me, I should not ignore what he did, but I could say in the book, Ethel forgave him. And that said a lot to me and I hope to readers. Yeah. Uh, on, on my end, I think part of it was, um, and I didn't find this out until I was mostly done with the project, is Jane was dying um, when I was talking with her. And I think she was just trying to sort of get everything on the record at that point in a, in a way. Um, because she was another one, sort of like Ethel, was very forgiving of Jim. And, and more than anything, as you ran into as well, Larry, constantly said he was a fantastic father. His children meant everything to him. Like, I mean, I think she was, I think she was trying to get certain things down on the record, knowing it was her last time to say it. Um, because again, she was, she was very open about everything was the one who broke the news to me. Um, and so, and, and there could have been a little bit of legacy building on Jane. She was a very modest person. Uh, you know, I had let her read the first draft of the book and she told me, and here's a quote, I made her sound too damn important. Um, but you know, I, I, I told her that I got to make that decision and not her. Um, so I, I, but I do think a lot of it was because, I mean, she died before the book even came out. She was, she was ill the whole time. So I think that did uh, influence her. I think she realized she kind of had nothing left to lose at that point as well. Um, we're getting a question here on uh, what about figures who are not as well known? Um, for example, I mean, it is, it is when you're writing about Lee and you're writing about, you know, writing about McCarthy to some extent and, and the Trumps, I mean, these are, as you were saying, Mary, they're historical figures. They're going to matter regardless. It makes it a little, I don't want to start to say easier, but you're, because you're writing a framework of history. What about somebody who is an unknown figure? Does it make it almost easier to write about somebody who's an unknown person who's terrible because you don't have any investment in the person at all? Can I take a quick crack at that? Sure. The, so my first book, when I knew even less than I do now about writing books was about a guy named Edward L. Bernays, the so-called father of public relations. And he was known to a hundred public relations people and to a dozen journalists, but to most of the world not. And I think part of what you do when you're making the case to a publisher that they ought to publish a book about somebody who's unknown and to an audience that they ought to read it is you tell them why the person ought to be known. And I was trying to say, the book was called The Father of Spin. And I was trying to say, in an era of spin, we cannot understand it without looking back at the world's first spinmeister who represented companies and presidents and everybody. And that's the case that's easy to make to readers because you're not going to have to make it to readers unless you've made it to publishers. You want to show that your unknown character is somebody that history somehow missed. He or she is like the New York Times obituaries today when they're going back and saying whatever they call that series where they're looking, these are the figures from history who we got wrong the first time around and so we're now going back and going to tell you why they should have mattered. Anybody else want to, want to take a shot at that? Mary, we've got a question here. Somebody's asking, why is Melania even included in this group of subjects? Is she a, a, an inherently unlikable person that we need to convince people to like, or is she a likable person that people are trying to make us not like? I think um, the idea that we have the first woman ever 
to have grown up in a, uh, in a country where English wasn't the first language, right? There was only one other first lady in history, um, Adams, and she was in England um, over, you know, but yes, she's, she is a fascinating character. The only problem is she um, doesn't tell what could be a great American story. I mean, her, her mom worked in a factory. Um, you know, she came here, she worked real hard. She was a survivor, but because Melania herself is in this strange world, the Trump world, where you can't really talk about um, ever coming from nothing except a place that had gold toilets and gold seat buckles. She doesn't. It's a huge missed opportunity, but I think she is fascinating. And I think just the whole idea that she's in the White House, when she was in the White House, she was speaking Slovenian and the Secret Service had no idea what she was saying to her mother or to Baron. I mean, it's, it's, it's wild what was going on there. And also somebody was talking about how you look for what you don't see. This woman has no friends. She walks out of elementary school and never looks back, never talks to anyone. She goes out of high school every step of the way. It was though you shut the door and never looked back. That says something about her. Um, and so you constantly thinking about what, you know, this is really amazing. She is the most locked down. She's like a silo of one. I mean, apart from her parents and Baron, um, there's, I mean, it's just shocking. Uh, I mean, even talk to people that cleaned her room every day and would talk about how, how small her orbit was. I mean, she's, she is interesting. There's no doubt about it. If she was just a tough target because she was alive. She had, you know, you, Trump had armies of people that were blabbing about him, right? I mean, think, look at all the books written about him. Even people that he hired were talking about the outrageous things. He's like a gold mine of like amazing, shock, shocking stories. She's the opposite. Uh, so she was just a very tough target. Um. I'm actually going to um, see if there's any more questions when I come in from floor because we've got two minutes here, um, and I don't know if there's uh, if there's any any other questions from the floor that that anybody want to get anything. And somebody's addressing one to me on Dr. Seuss, but I don't want to take the panel's time on these things. So um, uh, I, th I think what I'll I'll just do is I'll just wrap up because I think this has been a great session. I think that um, I think what we learned is. Um, and somebody can maybe correct me on this if I, if I didn't get this right, that it's not that important to like your subject. Um, it's important to have a relationship with your subject, I think, that matters to you as the writer. I mean, would anybody disagree with that? So no, I, I, think think that's, I think that's true. I think that's true. Because if the only standard by which you write a biography is whether you like someone, then you've got two problems. One is you can get deeply into the research and discover you don't like them. What do you do then? Mm -hmm. The other problem is you can't just write biography, and I'm thinking especially in a long-term historical biography, purely on the basis of what one likes or doesn't like. You have an obligation to the entire historical record to be able to talk about all the people who were involved there and what motivated them. Um, thinking back to what M Mary was saying about uh, Melania, uh, one of the things that I think was the most intriguing in writing about Robert E. Lee was looking for one of those dogs that didn't bark. And it was really this one particular thing and that is in the correspondence that dominates Lee's life from the time he's a, a, a late adolescent until well into the Civil War, he never once refers to his father. And his father was the Revolutionary War hero, Light Horse Harry Lee. That was a dog that didn't bark. And I had to wonder why, why, why? And that, in a lot of respects, that was a key towards unlocking some real mysteries about Robert E. Lee's personality. So can I just say one quick thing, which is, I think that Alan is right that you don't have to love your subject. Um, I think you've got to love their context. And the, I right. love, I'm deeply into this jazz age era now, and I love that. And I also loved a lot about the 1950s, whether or not I like Joe McCarthy. And loving the era that you're looking at and the history of it helps a whole lot. Yeah, yeah. I'd say the same thing about the Civil War era. That's what I have loved from the time I was a kid. Yeah. 
Mary, you have anything? We'll give you the last word here. It's 145. We hit our target here. We hit our post, as they say. I think that I need to, um, I don't know if it's because my parents are from Ireland, um, you know, we're drawn to both, uh, you know, really happy things and really sad things. But I need after the trauma of the girls in Cleveland and the trauma of the Trumps to find that happy thing. So I think we just need to mix it up. <laughs> And I think that's about as well put as it's, been, it's going to get today. Mary, thank you for that. Alan, Larry, it's been a pleasure. Uh, I really appreciate the comments rolling in on the right-hand side of my page are all saying fantastic. Uh, and it's fantastic because of you guys. So thank you so much uh, for being a great panel. Um, I've read many of your books. I'm going to make my way through all of them if I can at this point. And uh, I see Steve is applauding us up there as well. Thank you, everybody who, uh, who watched and who listened. And uh, thanks for your questions on the side. And thanks again to the panel. You guys were great. Thank you.